Hello. Hi. <laughs> So I'm here with Ling Yi. Tell us more about yourself. I'm a doctor from the public healthcare sector and I'm currently training to be a family medicine specialist. And you are also volunteering on the side. Tell us how you got into that. So a couple of years back, I was thinking of a way that I could give back to society for a cause that was more than just myself and my job. And I looked around and I tried a couple of different causes such as underprivileged families, animals, as well as refugees. But but palliative care was something that held a special place in my heart and so this is where I am now. What sparked that interest in palliative care at the start? My mom was diagnosed with cancer and it eventually became metastatic. In the last few months of my mother's life, a home hospice team, so it's a team of people, doc doctors and nurses from the hospice would come yeah. to visit us and look after us and uh, ask us questions and make sure that her symptoms are well controlled. Mm -hmm. So following that in the next months and years, we were learning on how to cope with this together as a family. And from that, I learned a lot of things and I wanted to be able to give back, um, um, to share with people the lessons that I've learned. When I went back to work, I requested to work at a hospice and it was sort of a full circle event for mm -hmm. me. I subsequently became the home hospice team and I, I went to people's houses to guide them in their final journeys yeah. and that was very meaningful. Maybe you can run me through like what happens on a day to day, like the people you meet, the conversations you have. In my experience mm. uh, working in the hospice, we as a home team visit people from all walks of life. So it's a range of environments and people are obviously at different stages. Um, they could be very early on in a disease with about one year of prognosis left. It could be up to the final days as well. So no matter what their situation is, we would go into the house and then we will assess the situation and then we will respond. So for example, if somebody is at the end of their life with just a few days left to live, we would prep uh, the, the person and as well as the family, what is going to happen in the next few days, what can you expect? And usually we will prepare medications for them. And what, and then, what are these medications? Like, is it specific to what they're going through or is it something that kind of helps to calm them down? Mm. So actually it's both, you, okay. you have rightly guessed it. Um, so I have this interesting story. There was this patient that told me, Doctor, what if this was the last time that I ever closed my eyes? And then I was like, um, don't worry, auntie, one one lah, one one lah. Then I ran out of the room and I was like, oh my gosh, what do I say? Yeah. <laughs> so after that, I went to my social worker friend and I was like, help, a patient just asked me this, what do I say? Yeah. And um, she was like, calm down. I think first you have to understand why is she asking this question? What is she actually afraid about? What do you think she's afraid about? That's like, oh, okay. So first you have to identify what is it that is driving that question, that existential crisis, and then you try to piece it apart. So some people, they want to be able to work through their emotions, mm -hmm. and some people simply just want to share that feeling that they are experiencing. What are some of the I guess more significant questions that the family members ask you? A lot of them are very confused about how to do, deal with all this uh, end-of-life matters. They are not sure about how to approach their loved one and sometimes they are not sure of what to expect. So we kind of hold their hand to bring them through this, this final journey and uh, calm them down. Other than that, um, some of the common questions they ask uh, would be like how to give this medication and mm -hmm. then we'll teach them how to do it. So in other words, you're, you're there like as a form of support. I mean, if I were going through it, I think that I would want someone to be there to catch me, you know, like when mm. I fall or like someone to depend on. Do you feel like that's your role in all of this? And is that what drives you to do that? Yeah, kind of like a guide actually. Yeah, but before you got into that, you were also doing things like reviewing content, you were speaking. Uh, tell me more about like this journey of yours and how you became where you are today. So when I first started at uh, volunteering at Singapore Hospice Council, they started off uh, with giving me smaller tasks such as reviewing content. So for example, they have this series of live books that talks about patient story in a very engaging and a very graphically beautiful format. And there was also a couple of other pamphlets. So common questions like what can we eat at the end of life? Or how can we look after um, someone who is experiencing end of life symptoms? So they had all these beautiful brochures and books 
and they passed me an entire stack of it and I went around reviewing it with friends, with my mom, and, and I helped to collate the feedback from a layperson point of view and then we gave it back to Singapore Hospice Council for them to sort of uh, improve their content for future purposes. One of the other things they got me to review was this pack of conversation cards. Some people, they often say, oh, how do I start talking to my dad and mom about these things, you know, or oh, we're guys, uh, we don't talk about these things. Yeah. yeah so, so these conversation cards were to help <laughs> open that conversation. And I know that you also were speaking, so maybe tell mm. me more about like what you were talking about. So it's an online conference, um, part of the, the grief tapestry um, event, and uh, I shared about my experience of losing my mom, and people got to ask questions um, about my entire journey. And it was very interesting to hear from people. I think some of the questions people asked were like, was it difficult to deal with family members? Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's one of the things also that it, um, open conversations are very important because um, once you express your wish, nobody can argue with that because this is what the person wants. So in other words, you want to change the mindset uh, that people have on death. The goal is to get rid of the taboo of, of, of the topic of death. Some people think that talking about death brings it closer to them, so that's not true. In being able to talk openly about death and the prognosis, people can then make plans to resolve conflicts that they had before. It gives them the opportunity to say thank you mm. and, and things like I love you to people that, that they cared about. Most people have this idea of death being something that's negative, like you're losing someone uh, and it's sad, but the way you are seeing it is a way to celebrate life. Is that true? Yeah, actually that's yeah. such a nice way. <laughs> it. it is not all about doom and gloom of death itself because actually towards the final moments, most of the people are actually very peaceful towards the end. And I know that you have had experiences as a caregiver so maybe you can run me through like your days as a caregiver. I have definitely seen a lot of people be caregivers in my role as a doctor, but being a caregiver myself was an extremely tiring process. When my mom was in her final months uh, of her cancer, my family had to put in extra effort to support her. So I actually took a no pain leave from my job in order to spend more time with her. We had to help her physically with a lot of the tasks. Towards the final days, she didn't have enough strength to stand or even hold her posture. Another thing that we also had to do as caregivers was to take shifts. Towards the final days, my mom became very confused. She was saying words and behaving in ways that didn't make sense at all. She would take very long walks around the house and she would do this despite not having enough strength to stand on her own. So what we had to do was that we just stood with her and supported her. You know, as a doctor, we have calls, we have yeah. to do many overnight shifts, but it was nowhere near as tiring as caregivers. So I, yeah, we really, we really don't appreciate caregivers enough in our community. As a caregiver, you, you really learn through experience, but is there like different resources or like a course that people can take to learn more about how to be a better caregiver to someone that you love? For everybody, it, it differs quite yeah. a bit and it's a very personalised thing. SHC does have quite a lot of resources mm -hmm. on how people can help to care better for their loved ones and there are support groups that are available as well. So what's uh, one advice that you would give to someone who is a caregiver on how to push on or how to understand what, what someone else needs. What I've learned from my own experience as well as the experiences of others mm. is on top of being very creative and constantly trying new ideas on how to make them feel better, is also to make sure that you carve out some time in the week for alone time, time to yourself. Mm. Something that energizes you and something that, that that you can do to look after your own needs as well. Because as a caregiver, there are times where you have to completely let go of your sense of self. What is one story that maybe like you have kept close to your heart throughout your whole experience? There was a particular patient who I visited. Um, she probably only had about a year's left based on her current condition, uh, but she was super accepting and she was very at peace with herself and she was like oh I taught myself how to play this let me oh. play a song for you <laughs> and she played a song for us and it was a very peaceful moment just sitting in that very old um, you know old-fashioned style house with this elderly lady who was giving to us more than what we were giving to her 
and it was a very humbling experience. And so I would say that, that volunteering here has been a great experience mm -hmm. because I have changed so much about my own life and it makes me think about what is most important to me and whether or not I should continue to be doing whatever I'm doing. So would you recommend volunteering in the palliative care sector to anyone else? Yeah, I would actually, because life and death is something that we, all of us here, would have to experience. And volunteering in the palliative care sector is dealing directly with that. So that is relevant to anybody at any point of time. So it not only allows you to help others, but it also allows you to also learn more about yourself. You are very inspiring, very strong, by the way. <laughs> thank <laughs> I you. I don't think so, but thank you. To you. <laughs> to you for whatever you're going through. And I think you've inspired a lot of people to, to look further into the palliative care sector and I guess the mindset on death. I think that was my takeaway from my conversation with you. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for allowing me to share about this, which is something that's very close to my heart. All right, we've come to the end of the second episode of Just Life. I think it really changed my mindset on death. I've always had issues with grief and accepting death of a loved one. But after speaking to Dr. Chia, it really just encouraged me to see life as more of a celebration and it definitely gave us more insight on what palliative care is about and showed you how you can volunteer in this sector to raise awareness on palliative care and end-of-life planning. Now, if you want to know more, Singapore Hospice Council actually just launched a game where you can learn more about it. The reason why this game is so important is because you get more information on palliative care, what to expect and all the resources and support that is available. We've left the link in the description box for you to play. Till then, I'll see you in the next episode.